take it personally. It's one of my mantras, whether it's thinking about the story behind what you buy, how you travel and use energy. But that's what I like about hands-on. It's that it does get people taking it personally. Witness the huge numbers writing in to find out more and who then act upon the information. Well, in this week's program, there's quite literally plenty more food for thought. We highlight several stories about projects that safeguard the environment, do the poor a power of good, and have the potential for replication here and overseas. So keep watching to see what you can do. Orissa, Eastern India. The fertile land and temperate climate should be good news for farmers. Yet these forested hills are home to some of the world's poorest communities. Most rely on their orchards and livestock to survive. And while harvest surplus could be a source of income, these small-scale producers have little bargaining power in the market. Now a new scheme is helping them to compete. Here was an area which was very difficult. Traders, the processors uh, were not coming to this area. People from this area were not going out. A lot of problem of terrain, transportation, communication, and all these things were there. Still, we wanted to prove that even in this kind of situation, a post-harvest project can take place, and these people can be linked to the markets, and they can earn better profit. Although India has a vast rail network and good trunk roads, Many tribal people live in remote areas where getting to market is difficult. I've just walked 14 kilometers. I brought 60 kilos of turmeric. I can get higher prices from elsewhere, but it's too far to travel. Having traveled long distances to the markets, most sellers don't want to carry goods all the way home, so they're forced to sell at whatever price they're offered. International Development Enterprises, IDE India, supported by the UK Department for International Development, DFID, has found that processing produce is the best way for farmers to make a profit. It adds value and because it's processed, the goods can be sold further afield. We organised and managed the skill development of tribal women particularly, because they were involved in collection and cultivation and sale of these produce. We scanned technology around us and found out what is the most suitable for these tribal women to comprehend, adopt and use. So these women were trained in value addition. The women pool their harvests and work together in cooperatives which sell the finished products to benefit all the members. I have some land which we use for shifting cultivation, with cashews, pineapples and oranges. Before, we were selling to the distant market and not really getting a good price. Since joining this project and learning about the technology, I'm now earning better money. Once these horticultural products have been processed and packaged, they still need a reliable market. IDE has not only sought out individual shop owners, it's also coordinated with OMFED, the biggest dairy cooperative in the world. OMFED will sell the produce in its shops nationwide. Some of the women now earn five times more and their income is no longer dictated by the seasons. With my new income, I was able to repay my 1,000 rupee loan to the group and are now able to spend money on my children's education, health, medicines and for household use. Nigeria, West Africa. Small farmers here have grown cassava as a staple food for hundreds of years. And Nigeria is now the world's biggest producer. But in Africa, industrial processing of cassava is still limited. Now industry is exploring the many possibilities of this versatile crop and demand is soaring. At the same time, disease-resistant varieties are boosting productivity, giving farmers a chance to generate serious income.
Cassava came to Africa from South America. It's a tough crop, ideally suited to African conditions. Drought, flood, disaster, like cereal crops will always go down, but cassava will always stay there. That's why we say cassava is Africa's food insurance. But in the past, viruses like cassava mosaic disease have decimated crops. Because it affects the leaves, it automatically affects the photosynthetic apparatus of the plant. And once photosynthesis is affected, you can have yield loss in the roots. The International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, IITA, based in Nigeria, stays one step ahead of the mutating virus by breeding disease-resistant varieties popular with farmers. The IITA varieties give me joy from within. Traditionally, cassava is powdered and heated with water to make fufu, or mashed, sieved and fried to make gari. That is very good. By processing in rural areas using methods developed at IITA, value is added to the crop, bringing much-needed cash to remote villages like Ayamayong in Cross River State. It has helped us to alleviate our poverty level. Uh, from this cassava something, we use it in training our children. And then also we, the level of our women here has been promoted. This simple machine helps women sieve the mashed cassava before it's dry fried on a wood fired hot plate to mass produce gari. Cassava flour is replacing wheat in bread, cakes and pastry. The Nigerian government recently decreed all bread must be made with 10% cassava. This saves $40 million a year in wheat imports, makes bread cheaper and boosts demand for cassava. It becomes cheaper for us to get the bread loose. Or initially they talked about 10%, 5%. We went as far as 20, 30% of the floor. Cassava can also be refined to make starch for the pharmaceutical, food and textile industries. This starch mill can process 300 tons of cassava a day and with the raw material in short supply, large-scale cassava farming is taking over. Cassava is planted by simply cutting a length of the stem and putting it in the ground. Paul Okpue is a state assembly member who's returning to the land to grow cassava as an alternative source of income. This is Niger Delta region that uh, has so much oil but so much poverty in, in contrast. We just got blinded by this black gold. I have personally believed that we can give uh, the oil companies run for their money because uh, the oil companies don't provide sustainable wealth. But this is sustainable, this is part of us. The traditional farmers are beginning to have some value for their effort. And we're going to also make it become a more profitable venture. Mekong Delta, Vietnam. Memorials of the seven and a half year war with the US are everywhere. But a more recent conflict between the countries has left the local fish farmers floundering. The United States imposed higher tariffs on the Vietnamese catfish imports in 2003 to protect its own $600 million catfish industry. But not to be defeated, Vietnam's catfish farmers are biting back. The heart of freshwater catfish country is Vietnam's Mekong Delta. This farmer was raising two popular varieties, Tra and Barsa, at the height of the trade route. He's riding out the storm by moving into the more lucrative organic market. Breeding organically is more risky. Investment is higher and we can't give the fish any medicines or antibiotics. So we have to leave them to die if they get sick, for example. But the price for organically farmed catfish is more stable and I can profit between two and two and a half thousand dong per kilo. Tying bunches of lemongrass around the pond is a traditional way to keep fish healthy. Oxygenation and limiting stocks also helps control infection. Three years ago, this farmer made a good living growing catfish in a pond, but lost everything. He survived by diversifying and producing other species in cages beneath his family home. Now the catfish farmer in the Mekong Delta try to follow the way that can be bring something better for them, but also 
better for the consumer. I farmed catfish for eight years, but because of lower profits, I am stocking other species like silver barb. But if the price of basa rises, I would farm it again. It depends on market conditions. Of course, we as breeders have been affected as it's prompted people to turn to alternative species such as red snapper, common carp or tilapia. So my family has had to change our stocking breeds too. Not putting all their fish in one basket in these difficult times has proved a prudent move by the fish farms of the Mekong. Anton Imink is visiting from the Aquaculture Programme of the UK Department for International Development, which has been assessing the economic role of catfish and other aquatic resources in Vietnam. Diversification into catfish farming um, has allowed people who were going out of business to stay in business and continue to make a profit. Those still in the catfish business are exporting more to the European Union and with avian flu scaring consumers away from poultry, business is good. Due to the concern about the bird flu, so there, there will be very good potential for aquatic products including catfish produced in Vietnam in the near future. While neither side can declare victory in this skirmish, efforts by Mekong farmers to open up alternative markets should bring an upturn in their fortunes. Budapest, Hungary. Since the end of communism, the city has embraced the free market economy and investment has poured in. Capitalism has brought benefits for many, but not all. One problem is homelessness. But now business profits are being used to help those less fortunate get back on their feet. In the communist time, what they wanted was for everyone to have a job. So everyone was working. Everyone had some income and a place where they could stay, even though they were really poor. When communism ended, the people had no work and they would have to leave because the companies were closed and they couldn't support themselves. While the switch to a free market economy has helped some, others have found themselves left out in the cold. The state withdraws from a lot of areas where it was, it was active um, in the communist period, where it was normal to spend money. They don't do it anymore or they're spending much less. State-owned housing has fallen into disrepair and many people aren't even eligible. Behind the stunning architecture that attracts tourists, Budapest has around 25,000 homeless. The homeless depend on temporary accommodation like the crisis hospital, but not having a permanent address often affects their chances of getting work. Maybe employers should take homeless people who wish to work into more consideration. Priority should be given to homeless people who would like a job. They would then earn money this way and wouldn't have to rely on benefits. Now a scheme from the Diatores Foundation, supported by the Vodafone Hungry Foundation, is breaking the vicious spiral and helping those who dropped out get back into society. The old state-run system didn't really allow people to become, to become too desperate. It was a big cushion and it offered uh, quite easy income for quite a lot of people. That's gone, that's gone, it's gone forever. But the real issue is getting them back into housing and into work and into a social situation which they can sustain for a long, a long period. Giza and Chilla Horvats used to live at the crisis hospital. They even got married there. But thanks to the Dear Tourist program, they secured work as cleaners and can now afford to pay rent for their own apartment. It's peaceful here. We are more peaceful and more free. There are no restrictions. We can come and go freely. So from this point of view, it's better. But on the other hand, we have to pay rent and we are poor. It's not perfect. It's a small apartment and it's a struggle to pay the rent. But here at least, the Horvats have a home.
The Himalayan kingdom of Nepal has long been a magnet for foreigners, and the income generated by visitors is vital to the country's economy. Most Nepalese living in rural areas see little of the income as it's concentrated in the capital city. But by updating their traditional skills, many villagers are now bringing foreign cash and development to the countryside. Traditional handicrafts rely on centuries-old techniques, but as Tara Magar has found out, turning these skills into cash isn't easy, as a lack of consistent quality leads to few sales. I can send the children to school. It would be easier if sales were good. We should make them attractive right from the beginning. The sisters in our village have not made them properly. If they were more attractive, buyers would want them at first sight and they would sell well. For others, the challenge has been finding a market for their products. Now TRPAP, the Tourism for Rural Poverty Alleviation Program, managed by the UNDP and supported by DFID, is providing training for producers and marketing the products to tourists. The Rural Tourism Program is designed to give local people the maximum benefit out of tourism. The program is having a real impact. I'm making bamboo handicrafts now. We use locally available raw materials, bamboo and nigalo bamboo, and so on. 80% of the materials used to make bamboo handicrafts can be bought from the local market. Lumbini in the southern plains is another poor rural district, but as the birthplace of the Buddha, it has a rich heritage which attracts pilgrims and tourists, offering more opportunities. We already make money from this, and nowadays, when we have spare time, after our domestic work, we make statues. We can make some money. We take the statues to TRPAP and to the Lumbini flower shop. There are other places as well, and gradually we are building a market. The finished products are destined to be shipped all over the world as souvenirs. The impact of rural tourism in Nepal is uh, quite appreciable and it, it should be promoted to reduce poverty. Cambodia's capital, Phnom Penh, lies on the Mekong. Not just a beautiful scene, the river provides transport and income for the city's one million population. Now another nearby stretch of water, polluted with the city's sewage, is offering unlikely economic opportunities for the three and a half thousand families living around its shore. Most people living on the lake are informal settlers who fled the city in the 1970s during the brutal reign of Pol Pot. They earn a living cultivating aquatic vegetables, in particular water spinach or morning glory, as it's commonly known, a favorite in all Asian cities on the Mekong. The nutrients that feed this vibrant green harvest are not from artificial fertilizers, but from human waste present in the water. Phnom Penh is one of four Asian cities being studied by the Papusa project. The objective of the project basically is to understand um, aqua aquatic production systems around cities in, major, in, in Southeast Asia. For as long as Bong Ching Ek remains to be a sewage lake and the supply of sewage from the city is unhindered, then morning glory production can thrive. The scale of Phnom Penh's morning glory production can be estimated using the Institute's satellite imagery. This is the main area of morning glory production. It's approximately 200 hectares. Surveys conducted by Papusa show average household income from Morning Glory is between $10 and $20 a day. I'm involved in Morning Glory production every day from 7 in the morning until 4 in the evening. I have five children and I earn enough to support my family. While the rewards can sustain a family, harvesting the vegetable, rain or shine, has its drawbacks. 
The skin on my hands and feet gets irritated by the wastewater. I eat it both fresh and cooked, but it tastes best when fresh. I've never suffered from diarrhea or stomach problems, even when I eat it raw. In case they want to eat it in raw, they should uh, wash it and clean it properly. The most common problem is, you know, eczema, the dermatitis. Different workers got different problems, like uh, construction workers. They also suffer from allergic contact dermatitis, but just the different uh, substance, which is cause a problem. But Morning Glory is high in nutrients, and its taste and versatility make it popular. The customer know the soft of the Morning Glory, but um, they still buy it to cook with uh, noodle, put in the soup. Some customer use it for something like fermented sauce. The aquatic plant production is very uh, neutral benefit, nothing harm to the nature, to the lake, because this one help to consume the phosphorus and nitrogen from the sewage system. People tend to react negatively to all things that has something to do with waste or wastewater. I think it has to be way with whatever opportunities available for a household. For them, maybe a skin problem is livable than having nothing to eat.